one team too that are going to try to collate and um, we'll end yeah. uh, with some opportunities for some additional questions. Love it. So. Love it. All right. It looks like we're getting folks joining right now. Good afternoon, everybody that's uh, coming in and joining us for uh, a good conversation about to take place on jumpstarting your pipeline for 2021. Uh, we're going to have a great discussion here shortly. I'm just going to give a few more minutes for uh, folks to roll on in here. Um, as we go throughout uh, the discussion, feel free to drop questions into the chat the plan. The game plan for today is that we're going to spend about 30 to 45 minutes uh, with a discussion amongst the panel. I have some questions prepared, um, but then at that point, I also want to turn it over and open it up uh, to those of you that are on uh, listening and joining us live. Um, those of you who are watching this in the future and unable to ask questions, sorry, but uh, Hopefully you get a ton of value out of it anyway. Um, so we'll just give it a couple more minutes here uh, and then get started. Seeing some friendly uh, friendly names in that participant list right now. I'm digging yeah, that. For sure. Digging that. Thanks everybody for joining. Should we get some, uh, some fire going for our pipeline? Kick Dan, dude, you're on fire right now. You're Ooh, on fire. I like it. <laughs> wow. Got to get the pipeline going. Wow. <laughs> I love playing with these things, but it, this actually reminded me, Josh, you'd mentioned your uh, your previous colleague was on the phone and had their name yeah. changed. I yeah. forget to turn those off all the time and you join the next meeting and it makes no sense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't need to be on fire on your next call unless everything's on fire and it's like an earnings report and it's not looking good. Right. Yeah. That, that'd be fine. Sue. Yeah. <laughs> hey guys, everything's on fire. Don't worry about it. We're fine. We're fine. We'll get out of this one. We'll get out of this together. I'm going to do that for every investor call from here on out in my life. I'm just going to have it. Everything's on fire behind me. And that's, that's all I'm going to say. I'm just going to say, guys, everything's on fire. <laughs> help send help. I don't have anything to report. It's all on fire. Yeah. Katie, I have to just say that it took about 15 minutes before we actually turned on the broadcast here for Josh to get that camera quality on fire. So she's chatting yeah. and that your camera quality is on fire. Oh, oh, no. Yeah. I mean, I can go between, I can go between a lot of different things. So, I mean, we can, we can change the video. I can, I'll jump over to this uh, cheaper digital display. Hey, here I am over here. <laughs> you know, I can do that. But, uh, but I prefer, you know, here's the deal, you know, um, when you have the biggest title at the smallest company on a webinar like this, you have to really step up, right? Like what's a sales reach with HubSpot and Vidyard? Are you freaking kidding me? Well, I look the part baby. So, you know, that's how we do. That's how we do it. Sales reach. That's how we do. So yeah. Anyway. For sure. You guys just missed that. His hair and makeup people are just standing off the there, way there too. So. They, they, they keep telling me to stop quaffing it in that direction. But anyway, yeah, that's what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. All <laughs> right. So we got quite a few folks here. Uh, about 23 people chimed in so far. Um, so let's go ahead and get started because um, we got quite a bit to cover. So um, obviously we're all, you know, breathing a huge exhale after one of the most crazy years uh, ever for any of us in business and sales and in marketing. Um, so I reached out to the three folks that uh, you see here joining me to start thinking ahead, start looking ahead. Um, I've heard from a lot of clients, a lot of partners, a lot of prospects throughout the last year. Man, let's just get through 2020 and let's get going on 2021. So I figured it's a good time to say, let's go ahead, start looking forward and let's start taking some of the lessons from uh, 2020 and see, you know, how we can prepare to jumpstart that pipeline in 2021. Um, as I was prepping for this panel, I came across a really good um, sentiment from McKinsey on kind of what's happened to sales over the last year. So I just want to kind of open up the panel discussion with this. Um, I'm going to read it to you, and I apologize for that, but I also have it up on the slide here so you can follow along. Um, so sales has always been a sensing organization, attuned to changes in customer sentiment, shifts in demand, and the requirements of different buying stages. But those senses are being flooded as customers shift to digital engagement, leaving sellers with more channels to cover 
and more interactions to manage. The pandemic has amplified these challenges, exposing weaknesses in existing sales models and gaps in digital readiness. In many ways, this data revolution in sales matches what happened to marketing departments about three to five years ago when they were forced to reorient their functions to be more analytically driven. With more data flowing in from non-traditional sources, such as video calls and webinars, few of which are actually captured by current sales processes, understanding which customers to focus on, what they care about, and how they want to engage can often feel like a guessing game. And I'm going to put an editorial comment in there, like you're drinking from a fire hose. So that's from a McKinsey blog post on October 1st. So I'm going to open up to the panel um, and just ask each of you, how in your own organizations are you responding and reacting to this big shift and this big change? Um, and at the same time, I'd like you to just introduce yourself and the organization that you're representing. So we'll start with the guy who has his own uh, hair and makeup crew, Josh Fetty. Oh, sure. I get to go first. Jeez, that's, that's real fair. Thank you so much. Um, listen, this article right here, this is, I don't want to get all salesy here, but this is exactly why we built the product that we did. I'll just put that out there right now. I can't believe this article was just written. This, this drives me crazy that this is recent news. This is not recent news. This is, yes, like COVID has caused sales to change in the way that they engage with their prospects, but the reality that sales professionals needed to start working in a more digital first way, that is not recent news. That should not be on the top of the uh, newspaper right now. HubSpot's been talking about this for years. They've been talking about the modern buyer. They've been talking about all these great tools to create a better experience for prospects, but it's been through the lens of a marketing first sort of objective, right? And what was happening because of this, marketers were doing this incredible job. They were creating all these impactful presentations and ways for people to get through their experience. And then we would hand them off to sales and sales didn't have any of that cool stuff. Sales was like, hey, can you jump on a phone call with me? Can we go through this thing? And people were like, why was it so easy to buy from you up until the point I actually had to buy from you? What the heck is happening here right now? That's when that article should have been written. It took COVID for that article to actually be written. And that's the problem that we're faced with right now. Um, regardless, off my soapbox for probably five minutes until the next time I get to talk, but i um, supposed to do an introduction. My name's Josh Fee. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Sales Reach. Um, we help customer facing teams better personalize the experience of buying from them. We want to make it easier for our, our customers' prospects to review the information they need to review, to better personalize the information they're looking at, to infuse themselves into the sales process in a digital space using tools like video. So, you know, the panel that we're on here, we're all close friends. We're all in a very similar space. This is what we're trying to help people do. But the, the similarity between everyone on this, on this panel is we started doing this before COVID. We knew that sales reps and customer-facing teams needed to be more engaging in a digital environment to keep up with marketing long before COVID, COVID just amplified the need for that to continue on. Awesome, thanks, Josh. So you invoked HubSpot. So Lou, let's jump over to you now to react to uh, that opening statement to make your introduction. First of all, I just have to say, Josh's energy level is off the charts. <laughs> I gotta do my best to just like get there, right there with him. So anyways, uh, I'm Lou Orfano. So I lead the sales CRM and the service products at HubSpot. Um, and what that means is like we're, I have basically everything about the marketing products that you talked about, right? And so uh, the, that part of the business is really uh, big and growing uh, and hundreds of thousands of, of customers at this point. And we're seeing everything from sort of the way that, you know, small, small businesses to really large enterprises are reacting here and they're coming to us with their needs and their questions. And we've also got a pretty darn big sales team at HubSpot that uh, is reacting uh, similarly. And so, I don't know, a couple of things I pull out of that is that we, one of the things that I think is important and I take away from that data is that you should really be looking at everything you're doing and trying to, like, I just like this idea of calibrating 
your go-to-market and your selling motion to what the new expectation is. Now, the reality is that expectation's probably been on the way to where it is now for a while, and you've been moving it to warp speed. Like one of the examples I use is like, as soon as the nicest restaurant in your town had to do delivery and takeout on DoorDash, uh, you knew that everything was gonna be really, really different. And so you should be looking at your services through the lens of what the buyer expects from them. So uh, if video is an expectation, if a massive SWAT team of seven sales reps flying in is the expectation, like you should still do that. But if selling online is the expectation in this new world, you should be doing that as well. And so, I don't know, I encourage people to think about things like that. Uh, don't just rush to do all the new stuff, but really do some calibration and some gap analyses on like where you're at and what your buyers expect, depending on what you're selling. That's kind of how I take that and, and how we're thinking about it. Awesome. Thanks, Lou. And last but not least, Dan, do you want to react to that opening statement and make your introduction? Sure. Yeah, I'm uh, Dan Wardle. I head up the sales team here at Vidyard. To Josh's point, you know, we've been doing this. I've been here for eight years now, trying to digitize the sales process and the marketing process. So it's been a long game. When I started at Vidyard, you couldn't actually have a video call. There wasn't like a thing. Um, yeah, we were a video company. It was a lot harder back then to sell Vidyard. Uh, <laughs> and you know, I go back, this was a, a manager's uh, retreat that we had when we were allowed to see each other uh, two years ago. And we actually took a document from HubSpot. This was just when we were launching HubSpot video. And it was all about how to create a frictionless sale. And so it was like the methodology that HubSpot uses on how to make sure that your sales process is frictionless for the most important person, the customer. And my favorite line out of this whole uh, two day you know, workshop we did was, oops, be careful, your org chart is showing. I don't care about SDR, BDR, AE. The customer wants to buy your product, make the best seamless experience for them. So I have a concierge team, one of them I think is actually listening right now, and their role is to just create the best experience from the moment that someone hits our website. So if that means that they take that you know, inbound meeting invite and just directly book it in an AE's calendar to make the best seamless experience for that customer, that's what they do uh, because that's the whole point. And then when the AE gets on the phone, we adjust the sales process depending on what that customer wants. So we've seen a ton of changes in the last nine months between our small business team and our commercial team. It's actually a bit counterintuitive. Our small business team used to be, you know, one call and then proposal done, 12 days. Now, the, those teams are actually, you know, the small business owners, uh, two of you on the phone are, are that, are, are just doing a little extra check. Like, actually, you know what, can we just have one more demo with our CEO, CEO just to, like, make sure before we sign? So that deal has actually gotten a few days longer. And that's fine. We'll, we'll do that for that customer. Whereas on the commercial side, the enterprise side, they're like, all of our field reps can't be on the field. Can you please get our product to them next week? And it's like, well, you have a legal and security review process, but on our side, sure, we can do that. Like whatever you need. And so then those deal cycles have gone from 90 to hundred days down to 37. So it's like this, just whatever the customer needs to make it as seamless for them and as easy for them is what you need to be thinking about. And then on the rep side, you know, we've always been digital first. So the fire hose analogy isn't as bad, except now you've got text messages, you've got multiple people who are in their home offices in different time zones, whereas it used to just be like everyone was in the Atlanta office and you could corral them in a room and do a Zoom. Uh, so it becomes a bit tougher on that side. Awesome. So I want to double tap on a word that you use there, um, reducing friction in the sales process. Um, COVID has definitely accelerated the, accelerated the need to do that. Um, I'm going to highlight a report, an update on a report that HubSpot published, I believe in October. They originally published it in March, looking at the impact um, that COVID has had on sales and businesses. One of the things that I found really interesting in this is it highlights exactly what you said, Dan, is all of the areas that you would expect um, that are reducing friction in the sales process are spiking. So things like online chat. Um, things like video. Um, people want answers to questions now um, because we're all working from home and we have different uh, cycles in which we're doing research. I saw somebody else um, cite um, our friends on the B2C side um, in Google that coined the term micro moments in search where we're sitting there searching for how to learn to want to go to and that's now applying to B2B. 
Um, I'm going to open this question to each of you as well, because you all have kind of different experiences, um, especially from the technology and the strategy of implementing that technology of how to reduce friction in the buying cycle. Dan, specifically, I want to talk about video because I know video, um, at least from our clients, uh, has been a huge, huge part of being able to reduce that friction and still be able to um, develop personal relationships uh, when we can't meet face to face. So how, how does a sales leader get, get a sales team over their own friction, over their own hump, where maybe they have a sales team of 18 or 20 people that know they need to change, but the speed of change is so fast, especially when it comes to video. Not a lot of people have hair and makeup and wardrobe like Josh has. Um, how, what are some tips and strategies that they can use to keep moving forward uh, and embrace some of the, you're gonna be You're going to be the target of all of this, Josh. You just have to realize that. I just, but it's fair, but can I call out, I woke up like this. So, I mean, <laughs> it's just, it's, it's just how it is, but it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. It's fine. So yeah, Dan, how, how, are, how can sales leaders coach um, and encourage their team to, to just get started? Yeah, I think you know, everyone thinks of my team and you, if you've seen Vidyard online, you see some of uh, my team's posts on LinkedIn, whatever it might be, you probably assume my team is just like experts at making videos. We taught them all how to do it and they're always making personal videos. Well, I can run reports because Vidyard has a big analytics center and I can see that 80% of the video my team is actually sending to customers is pre-canned content that's made by marketing or solution consultants. To, to your point about reducing friction, I don't have time to be making custom videos constantly all day long. Uh, it's important when you're trying to make a relationship. So maybe a demo follow-up, I will make a personal 30 second video introducing some pre-canned demos that my SC has made. We call them micro demos. So there's you know one that explains how HubSpot video works, one that explains how uh, you know the the analytics center works, like whatever it is that we can just quickly send, and that's like 80% of the content we're sending. So that's what you can really start thinking of. And and the key part that I said there is it's made by the SCs. Uh, now my SCs go a little bit above and beyond. They do some music intro and stuff, and they make them quite a nice micro demo. But I wouldn't suggest that's what you need. And we've actually had some situations where a more authentic video that you create that maybe doesn't have the best camera or makeup or anything, will get a higher response rate because the person receiving it realizes it's not a marketing spam email, you know, Josh made this video for me. And so we had this great example that our small business team did, this was two years ago, way before pandemic, where uh, they just made this quick video together saying like, hey, I'm really excited to talk to you and made a generic video and then like blasted it out to a bunch of leads that were kind of stale in the system got like a 10% response rate. Like, oh, this is great. Hey, you know, Brad, can you come in here and help me make a more professional video? And they used the DSLR and they did some cool stuff. Uh, and then they did the email blast again to the next group of leads and got half as many responses. <laughs> and they're like, what? Well, I just did all this work. So then they made, you know, a crappier video again. And they, the response rate went back up because you can see that it was a human that made it. It wasn't marketing. It wasn't polished. It was, I'm just making a relationship to you. This is, think of it as a handshake at a conference. If that personal video you send to somebody is that first 10 seconds you meet somebody at a booth at a conference, yeah. make the most of it, make it personal, not overproduced. Uh, sure. So that's how you get started. Don't, don't be worried about like having all the best stuff. Just make videos, try to make it so the lighting, you can actually see your face. That's like pretty important. But other than that, just start making videos. Awesome. Appreciate that. So Josh, I've, the next one's to you on the same kind of topic of reduce, reducing friction. Um, you had posted something on LinkedIn recently about um, evolving online demos and the face-to-face. -face. So I think we're all getting to a point where Zoom fatigue is a very real thing, but still the importance of face-to-face -face and when we can't meet in person, it's, it's absolutely critical, especially in B2B, being able to establish those relationships. So I just want to first quick highlight a stat from some research that um, Gong.io did, looking at um, the impact of, of actual face-to-face -face web demo, where it's actually spending more time with a face on a camera versus spending time on products and looking at slide decks, death by slide decks that when we're actually face to face with somebody, the closed one deals were um, 
41% more frequently push through a sales cycle. That's how powerful face-to-face is. So my question to you, Josh, is that your very cryptic LinkedIn post about the what you've done and evolved in your sales demos over the year or over the last few months, what have you learned? What lessons have you learned that have been able to help you break through with B2B buyers and still yeah. make your demos resonate and build how, relationships? How long do we have on this thing again? Are you guys going to cut me off in like five seconds? So this is a long story and it starts with HubSpot. So I'm good friends with Dan Tire at HubSpot. Dan Tire is, he's an incredible human. And uh, he was one of the first people that I told about my, my company before I started building it. I wanted to validate the concept with him. And when I finally built it, I called him up and I said, Dan, I did it. I built it. I want to show you what I did. Can I demo my product for you? And he said, yeah, absolutely. Here's, you, you got my calendar link, grab some time with me. I got on the call with Dan Tire and demoed my product. Now, when a person like Dan Tire, the director of sales at HubSpot, the sixth employee at HubSpot says, yeah, give me a demo. He's expecting a real demo. What I gave him was, I'm geeking out about my product, man. I love what I built and I can't wait to show you it. He beat me up so hard when that demo was done that I kid you not, I cried for the rest of the day. I'm not kidding. I had recorded this demo because I was going to show it to my investors because I couldn't believe that, you know, I was so excited. I was sure Dan Tire was going to say, this is the most amazing thing. Uh, This is the most amazing sales tool since the cell phone. I can't wait for other people to see this. This It's incredible. And instead he beat the snot out of me. And here's what happened. After I got done crying, I listened to my demonstration six times, six times. I went through all the cycles of grief. I went through the anger, the regret, the denial, whatever the stages are. And when I was done, I realized exactly what the man had done. He was not attacking me. He was coaching me. He was coaching me in the best way possible. He deconstructed everything I did and he was 100% right about everything he said. And every time I get on a demo call to this day, I'm not kidding. I hear his voice in my head. It's like Morgan Freeman, the voice of God, Like, don't do that, don't say that, shut up, stop talking, ask a better question, dig deeper, right? All those important things. Those were things that were important before COVID hit, okay? Like, I would say 50% of the business that I was uh, bringing in for the company pre-COVID was local. I was meeting with people face-to-face. So I was able to be a little bit sloppy on my online demos and still, like, be very, very fun in, in in a personable space and win enough deals. But when COVID hit, I had to really learn how to master this. And here's what I've come up with, if I'm going to just make it very, very simple, is you really need to realize and just embrace the fact that the best sales professionals in the world, one of the the skills that all of them share is that they're all great entertainers. They love to host. I love to host, man. My office that I'm sitting in, I got a scotch bar. I've got like 15... 25 different brands of scotch, like anyone's welcome all the time, except for right now during COVID, right? I love to have people in and bring them into the culture that I've created here and the lifestyle of sales reach and the lifestyle of working with Josh. That's what all professional salespeople are really good at. And I think that this whole digital thing threw us a loop because it's so much easier to take someone to a great restaurant that gets great reviews or to take them to the best golf course they've ever been to, to build that relationship and create that excitement of working with you. If you can figure out how to be an entertainer during sales calls, during your demos, to make your online demos more interactive, to have some Q and A, to ask the right questions, to remember to have the callbacks to the things, you're not asking questions in the first 10 minutes just to like get through that. No, you're asking the questions at the beginning to make sure that as you're going through, you can call out individuals and say, Julie, you specifically were interested in talking more about this. We're at that point in this demo right now. I want you to see this right now. This is for you. So really, really important. What's this Lion King reference? I I don't even understand what that is, but anyway, I I love that. He's the sales lion. Come on. He's the, sal- he's the sales lion. I mean, it's and, it, and it's true. But regardless, anyway, that's, I mean, look, make an experience. And this translates to everything that you do in business development or as, as any customer facing team. 
what is the experience that you're creating for people? Because people will never stop buying from people that they like. They'll never stop buying from people that they like. We all like to work with people that we like. Create a better experience for them. Work harder to make sure that they're entertained, informed, educated, that no matter what happens at the end of that call, that they're leaving better educated and more informed to help their business, irregardless of the fact of whether or not they work with you, and then you've won. Yeah, Josh, one of the things that we say a lot at HubSpot, which you've all probably heard, is, is to add value before you extract value, right? And 100. So that was... That was like the mantra, especially during the inbound marketing days and the early days. But if you take that to what you're saying about demos and the sales process, I think it applies just as equally where, you know, not everybody's got a sparkling personality that they're going to be able to wow people, but they can try their best to add as much value as humanly possible. Uh, I think when you do it mid funnel, it's way more impactful as well, right? Than it is like way top line because it's going to be hard to be super targeted and really add uh, customized value. So I don't know. I would just say like, if you can nail personality and value, uh, that's amazing. If you could choose one of the two, I would probably choose value uh, if you only have the ability to do one. So uh, just something to think about. I think it kind of applies, which is, which is an interesting thing to think about. So. The so, only thing uh, I didn't rant on at all with that that I think is important to call out as well is we're... In what we're talking about right now, we're talking about like in a digital space, these are new things that are being thrown at you. Don't forget the skills that got you here, the skills that got other salespeople that came before you to success, right? There's so many things that I think we sometimes forget we need to be focusing on in our sales efforts. We, we, we get in this digital space and we just get in this digital mindset and we forget about like the soft skills that like, won us deals when we used to be face-to-face, -face, right? Try to continue to bring those things back into the conversation. And you're totally right. You do not have to, look, I look like I'm completely jacked all the time. This is just how I am. Like I'm Billy Mays meets like Chris Farley. That's who I am. I own it. It's fine. Don't worry about it. But not everybody is that person, right? But you can be the person that knows the ins and outs of your product, 100%. That's a skill that no sales professional should have forgotten because if you know your product inside and out, and if you know your competitor's products inside and out, and if you know the products in the marketplace that your product can pair well with inside and out, you can always have an educated discussion to help guide somebody better. It's all about bringing that value, right? So you're totally right on that, Lou. And what I loved about that part, Lou, was, you know, when you said you got to add value before you can extract value. Uh, there's actually a lot of, uh, you know, child rearing books and, and stuff about raising children that talks about it as a piggyback. You can't expect something from them until you put something in their piggy bank, until you give them affection, until you add value to them on a sales call. Love your part, Josh, around like, not only should you be the expert in your own product, you should be the expert in your industry. For a long time, my title at Vidyard was video marketing specialist. I was a salesperson, but I had to be the expert on marketing and demand generation. And so I'd get on a call. I still remember this one. We, we sat down with uh, eight by eight and 45 minutes of the hour was talking about digital ads and how to optimize SEM. Vidyard does nothing to do with that. <laughs> but I was talking about how we do it internally, how we optimize for it to show that we were the experts in marketing. And then 15 minutes about like, here's how video can help with uh, tagging people and scripts and things like that. And so you just need to be the expert so that you're adding value constantly. And, you know, there was a uh, initial sales leader at Vidyard who really believed that if you were to meet a customer in person, you'll close the deal. And I flipped that and I said, no, nope, the customer that's willing to meet with you in person, you'll close the deal. You don't have to meet them in person. I, I used to travel every week for my first job out of school for seven years. I would go down to Atlanta, Georgia, wherever I was. So I hated traveling after that. And then I started having kids. So I, like, then I just stopped. <laughs> so for me, it's like, no, I, I'm going to get them to agree. Oh, yeah, we love you to host you on site. Actually, I can't make it. Why don't we do a Zoom? And then let's do it. Because the fact is that they were willing to meet, and that's an indicator. And so nowadays, it's, it's tougher to ask that because you can't. But now it's like you need to add value. You need to know something you know, personal about their job, about how you're going to help their business to really make sure you've got that same uh, – <laughs> that same uh, uh, feeling with the customer. We've yeah, just hit our, uh, our video recording limit. 
probably because did. of that beautiful yeah. HD camera that Josh That's, has. Probably it's, was sucking down nope. all that bandwidth. Man. Don't worry. I'm I'm firing that assistant right now. Can you hit the re- No, I'm kidding. It was me. I'm doing it all myself over here. I'm doing it all myself. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah. One of the things this reminds me of, though, is uh, just how important it is uh, and what you should be coaching your reps on. Uh, and I think, like, when we think about friction, just, like, one thing that came to mind was we had this just fascinating data that said that uh, 82 or something percent of managers and leaders say that they're providing coaching, 82%. And then when you go and ask reps how many of them feel like they're being adequately coached, it's <laughs> sub 50%. And so that part's just incredible. Like if that's not where a low hanging fruit area for friction, I don't know what is. Um, And so it's just, it's something to take a look at in your org is like, what are the messages that are trickling down and what is the time being spent in one-on-ones all about things like that? Yeah. This is an awesome discussion. Um, I did ask as people were registering, if they had questions um, and we're going to have some time at the end of this as well, for those that have been listening, collecting questions um, to chat them in. So if you have some, you can feel free to start chatting those in so we can pull through those um, as we get closer to the top of the hour here. Um, I'm going to just kind of go through some of the questions that um, the attendees dropped in here. Um, And as you feel uh, like it, best fits you, feel free to jump in and answer it. Um, When looking to kind of drive and to start um, pushing forward modern and digital sales strategies, um, if if you kind of identify a top priority or low hanging fruit, knowing that resources aren't unlimited, um, time isn't endless, but where, where would you suggest a sales leader start in saying, this is where we're gonna go for Q1 of 2021, let's start um with this one thing is it better training is it adopting a new technology is it reshifting their entire sales process um what would you recommend um and if you each want to respond to that um because you each have a different take that would be awesome i just we get that a lot um as we're working through with our clients on sales and marketing transformation is where do we even start um I, I always say, how do you eat a whale a bite at a time? So just start somewhere. Um, but I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on that as well. So you've done the eat a whale me- reference and you did another cliche one at the beginning. So this is two, Ryan. You only have one left and we're cutting you off with those. I know All it's right. fine. But they I'll work, keep, Josh. They work. I'll keep my answer real short because I, and I also want to make this really clear. Um, start by asking your team what they would actually use. Start by asking them what they would be comfortable with. And what I also see more times than a sales leader selecting tools for the sales team is marketing leaders selecting tools for the sales team and not having the conversation with sales about what's coming down the pike. And when they roll those tools out after they've invested months of time and resources, that's when they find out this isn't actually what our sales team needed to make their process better. So start by asking them what they would use, give them options, ask them if they have ideas of things they've seen, but ask them what they would actually use. You'll have a lot more success with that. I think it depends on where somebody's at right now, right? Like if if they already have HubSpot and they're using sequences and everything, you know, they're, they're already well ahead. The thing I would start with right now is really taking that step back, listen to calls. It goes back to the point about coaching. Like businesses have changed and it doesn't matter which business you're in. You know, we, we are on the positive the video is now a trend and it's great, but you might be the other way. Either way, things had to change and your reps maybe haven't changed. And that came up earlier. And so like review those calls and really figure out the coaching that you need to deliver. I would say the tools come secondary tertiary. There's, there's free products like HubSpot CRM and Vidyard that you can use. Like, don't worry about the tools to Josh's point, ask them what they're going to use. More importantly, understand what has changed and how you're going to coach the reps to change along with it and be more effective with it. Uh, Because if you're still doing things the exact same way you used to, when we used to have conferences, when we used to be able to meet customers in person, like something's changed. So map that out and circle in big red marker what's changed and how you're going to do that part of the sales cycle now. Uh, Is it your, like HubSpot has all this data response rates are down by like two thirds. 
And so that means prospecting needs to change. How are you going to change it? What are you going to do different? How are you going to use social? How are you going to use text messaging? Which like people are fine with now. I've got like four prospecting texts today and I'm not mad about it. It's getting a bit annoying at four a day, but it's, like it's fine. And so you really need to identify and like we, we go through an exercise with this when people launch on Vidyard. It's like, where did you used to meet with people? And let's figure out how to use video to replace that. That's like just the base level that you need to figure out. And it comes down to really just coaching and reviewing calls and like the stuff that nobody actually wants to do, but it's the most important stuff. <laughs> and then you can get into tools and, and strategies and everything else. All right, you guys talked about tools and the reps. So I'll go a different way. I do think it's actually really important. Like if there was ever a time to do this, it's now. And that is just to ruthlessly align with what your buyer wants and, and align with your buyer, right? And so what does ruthlessly mean in this case? Like, are you really locked in with marketing on who the target accounts are that you're going after? Are you like really locked in there and, and fully agreed across the company? Um, have you done that map of how do they expect to buy from you? And are you actually delivering on that or not? And like audit a couple of sales processes that maybe you lost, like go do some retros on them. Um, talk to some that you've won as well. And then, uh, I mean, I do think that in five years from now, we'll be measuring like buyer NPS uh, in a B2B sales process, like regularly more so than before and more so than uh, anybody's doing right now. And, and if you think about getting to that world, what can you learn like nowadays about what's going on in the buying process that you can learn from? If like, we all know we're going to get to the point where buyers are going to be rating us, even if they don't buy from us, uh, how does that change what you would do right now? Right? Like how would, how would that change like the little micro moments that you would improve in the process? I think there's a lot of learning fruit there. I love what you said there. And I got to, I got to piggyback on that a little bit because I think it's a good idea to not just talk about the tools because the most powerful tool that you have is yourself. And I, I was reminded of this recently. Um, I sent uh, a personalized video to a prospect of mine on, on, on my system. And they responded and they said, dude, that was so cool. How did you do that? And I said, what are you talking about? And they said, when you said my name in that video, I looked at your lips, man. I couldn't even like, it looked like you were really saying it. I heard my name. I can't, I can't figure it out. I've watched it like 15 times. Like how the hell did you say my name? How did it say my name and your lips look like? And I said, I don't really understand your question. Are you asking me if I built an AI engine for like putting your name into my generic video? And he's like, yeah, how'd you do it? I said, I, I hit record and I recorded a personalized note to you. Now this could apply to so many things. Like this could be an AI automated email message this that like really triggers somebody. This could be an AI automated anything. But I think what we need to remember is that it's important to take a step back and stay human. Because if you look at those interactions you have and the response you get from people when you spend just a little bit more time making it a little more personalized, they really feel special. And I think that's even more important to be considering right now when it's not hard to understand that a large percentage of the population is feeling a sense of loneliness right now. Mm -hmm. They're honestly like looking for interaction. And that's why cold calling is calling, kind of having a resurgence right now because there's a lot of people that right now just want the phone to ring. They just want someone to talk to and they'll take that call longer than they normally would have. And it may not go anywhere, but they're still, they want a friendly voice and they love those kind of personalized things. It's, it's something to really truly consider. The more human you are, not your technology, the more human you are, the more difference you're going to make and the more impact you're going to make into that process with your prospects. Totally. And I think just released, go ahead. Sorry. McKinsey just released a, a new survey. I think it was yesterday. Uh, I'll have to look up what the name of it was, but they said exactly that, that like cold calls have made a resurgence and people who are still doing cold calls are outperforming their peers by like 41% because yeah. other people have just stopped and they've just been relying on like mass emails, like, just use my cadencing tool to fill the pipe. And, and that's why we're seeing such low response rates. McKinsey just published this yesterday. I've been saying it for like 60 days. So, I mean, good for them for finally catching up to me. No, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> but, but at the same time, there was also a recent article from McKinsey as well. And they polled buyers 
in the B2B space. And they said, look, sales has changed. What do you like about it? What do you hate about it? What do you want to go back to the way it used to be? 80% of the buyers in a B2B space that they questioned said, we like it better now. We like the way we engage with our sales prospects better now than we did before. So we don't want that to change. And I thought that is absolutely mind bending to think about the fact that like, how much money have I spent in the 20 plus years I've been in sales, taking people out for the best damn burger in the world right across the street, right? Like taking them out and entertaining them and doing all these things. And they would have rather me just be better in a digital environment. Are you kidding me? That's easy. Fine. Let's just keep doing this. It's fine. For sure. And I think a lot of that data bears out too. And even what I've seen, and I'll be the first to say I'm a marketer first and a salesperson second. I've, I have fought kicking and screaming as I built, built my business to become a salesperson. This environment is the most comfortable sales environment that I have because it's things like being able to send the personalized outreach emails and not feeling like I have to be you know, the slimy used car salesman that is dialing for dollars and spraying, yeah. spraying emails and hoping and praying that I hit a quota. So <laughs> I'm with, hey, yeah, I'm with, I'm with those, those folks on that 80%. I still slimy car the, salesman. Uh, the first sales guy Vidyard just before me, you know, we'd go to a conference and he was one of those people who's just amazing at a conference. Like he, you know, he's got the personality like Josh. He's out there, he's juggling in the middle of a crowd at Marketo Summit when we're like 10 people. And he comes back with like a stack of business cards. Man, I, I don't want to do that. That's not me. I, I'm like, Ryan, I just want to be in my, my home office here making some videos and, and having really good conversations uh, with people who actually, you know, want to engage. They're not forced to because you're at some corporate event. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. We need both of us in this world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right so we've got about 15 minutes left and i want to make sure that uh those listening if they have questions uh for the group that is assembled here um that they have a chance to ask those so i'm going to pause for a little bit um and give you a chance to chat those in um or raise a hand i just oh. discovered the raise a hand feature recently. can we do a raise a hand and let them in on the video side of things can we do I, that i will certainly try your pushing right. skills here but yeah the, if you raise a hand you have a chance to actually this is it if you ever had a oh. dream of being on video camera with dan lou josh or ryan now you can be on video with us right I here love, I, I love thanks for the afterthought josh yeah you no should... no no you're the well, moderator I, I, you come last. You're the moderator. It's just Fair the way enough. it works. Don't Fair worry enough. about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. By the way, I just put on my, uh, I put on a bracelet. This is the first bracelet I've ever worn in my life. Uh, Daniel Disney sent me the social selling bracelet. How cool is that? That guy's the jam, right? So, hey, if you're looking for some like social selling tips, follow Daniel Disney on LinkedIn for sure. Good to know. All right. Well, we seem Should- to have a quiet group today. I can do some more product plugs. I got uh, Ethan Butte's Bomb Bomb book behind me, if you want. I've got Dan Tyre and Todd Hockenberry's Inbound Organization behind me. I can read a couple chapters from that if you want to. That's a good one. <laughs> Guy, I got Guy Kawasaki's book back here. That's a good one. People That's should awesome. read that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. So it's going to be uh, story time with Josh now. Yeah, I mean, I can read you some stories. I got a David Sedaris book, too. There's a really good chapter in that one. I can read that if you want to. Yeah. All right. Well, we can let people get back to their day. Um, closing thoughts, guys, as you head into 2021. Uh, what is the thing that you're looking forward to the most? Um, and what is the what do you think is going to be the thing that's going to stick with us um, long after COVID is no longer part of the lexicon for sales and marketing? Um, or maybe that you hope it sticks around. Okay. What order are we going in? Who goes first? Do you want to go first? Well, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, I, I actually think it's really cool that we're seeing sort of the outside rep become an inside rep, the inside stuff moving to, to sort of e-commerce. And I'm pretty excited to explore that world, honestly. I think if you can like figure out the right blend of selling online and selling through reps and do it the right way, you can create like a really efficient customer-friendly model. And so- 
that's a lot of the stuff we're working on at HubSpot. Like we're trying to figure out the right blend there, give the reps the right tools, but also make sure the buyers like it. So I, I'm pretty excited for that. I think COVID has just made that more of a reality that we should do it. Like this has been on my mind for a while. Uh, we had a funny internal meeting like two years ago where a couple of us were trying to like float this and get momentum for it. Uh, and then suddenly like Brian Halligan's calling us saying like, where's that plan? Like, let's get this thing moving. So there's a lot that we're thinking about there. I think it's gonna be cool. Awesome. Dan? For me, it was, ironically, it was my father who is a, a retiree from you know Bell Canada, the telecom company here that mentioned this weekend, he's like back in the seventies when he was installing telephony in these big buildings, office buildings, you know, IBM buildings. Uh, he, somebody asked him like, Oh, I've heard there's going to be like a video phone. When's that coming out? And he'd tell people, Oh, it's actually going to be next year, but it's an extra $2 a month. Like, I don't know if it's going to be something you want. And he would just pull people's chains. Cause that's, that's uh, what he's, <laughs> he's all about. And now I'm like, that is the future. I think, you know, after we're all safe to visit one another again, first of all, the last thing that's going to be allowed is to have vendors come in your office. That's like, that's beyond anyone's future vision right now. <laughs> so sales motion is going to be like this for a while. And so the way I see the world moving is I started at Vidyard. There was no such thing as Zoom or any kind of video conferencing. Now we're sending videos in emails and in texts. What's next? Well, next is when you call somebody, it's just going to be a video call. That's going to be the default. It's just going to be FaceTime for the enterprise. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think that's what's going to live long beyond this. And, you know, just virtual selling, quorum, decision making. I just got off a call with uh, one of our potential customers and there was 27 of them on the phone listening to our demo. And it's not a huge company. I'm like, this, like, this is the new thing is it's allowing more people to be involved with the decision-making process. And then, you know, once somebody gets involved with being able to make decisions, they're never going to leave. They're always going to be there helping to make a decision. And so just expect that decision team to get bigger, and bigger, and bigger, uh, regardless of whether we get over this pandemic. Yeah. I mean, let's just say it like what I'm most excited about is for COVID to finally go away at some point. But look, here, here's what I'm really excited about from a business perspective. I'm so excited about how quickly people have had to embrace technology in good ways in their life. We're starting to see more good come out of technology than bad now. And it's been really exciting for me personally. I have friends all over the world now because of embracing the technologies that are readily available to me. I mean, I had a call with someone in the Netherlands the other day that became a fast friend, right? In the Netherlands, it's got a guest room for me. I can't wait to go there when COVID's done. It's going to be amazing, right? Um, met, I got to do a podcast with Daniel Disney, right? It, it was, it's absolutely incredible if you just look at the bright side of this and realize that, wait a minute now, um, if we're talking just about salespeople, many salespeople used to stay to their territory and many salespeople still have a territory that they stay to. But for someone like me, I can do whatever I want. I own a company. I can do whatever I want. I can call anyone I want. I can talk to anyone I want. And I literally can. I can literally talk to anyone I want. I can literally have a meeting with anyone I want. It doesn't cost me anything. I don't have to hop on a plane. I don't have to leave my family alone. I don't have to make a reservation at a hotel that I don't want to stay in. I don't have to do any of those things. And I can still have meaningful relationships and, and interactions with people all over the world. And I, I'm most excited about that. I'm most excited that people have had to speed up their adoption of utilizing technology in a good way. And I'm most excited about the reality that I don't believe that's going away. I think that all of the things that we've learned to embrace and to bring into our life and to improve our life and to give ourselves more time in the day to do either to do more or to have more time with others uh, is going to remain far outside of this. That's what brings me the most joy and excitement right now. Awesome. Dan, your video calling struck a question from the audience in the future. So the question was if anyone has received a cold FaceTime call. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've done it to people too. Have you seriously? I do it all the time. Why not? Yeah, because here's the thing. <laughs> if you call a switchboard at a company, yeah. um, nobody's at the company. 
So the switchboard doesn't know what to do with you. They just end up sending you off to never, never land. And you, so, but if you can find someone's cell phone, why not? Why not? Like, come on. Are you kidding me? Like, who cares? Like, what's the worst that's going to happen? They're going to be like, oh man, I don't, who are you? Right? Like, no, it's going to get a laugh. Who cares? I've done it. And I've had, and I've had people do it to me too. Um, and usually when they do it to me, I'm like, why are you FaceTiming me? Click. But you know, I, I've still done it. You know, it's fun. It work? <laughs> Hell yeah. Yeah. It works absolutely well. Yeah. I mean, it's look, everything works. If there's anything I've learned, it's that everything works. We recently had a guest on our podcast, Shiv. He said the same thing. Shiv Narayan, and he said the same thing. Everything works. It's just a series of trying new things, right? And it depends on the audience. When you're in a cold outreach mode, you don't know who the audience is, but like calling someone cold is just as disrespectful as calling someone on FaceTime. Neither one is more disrespectful, right? So like, hopefully they're not answering the phone from the toilet like 90% of the population does. But you know, as long as they don't do that, it's gonna be fine. Yeah, try things. Don't be afraid to try things. If you're afraid to try things, COVID's gonna kick your business's ass. Let's just be honest. Like if you're afraid to try new things, you're already out of business right now, right? And you need to embrace new technologies, new efforts, new ways about doing things, right? There's no reason that cold, cold FaceTiming someone should be a bad thing. They might not answer, but they're also not going to answer your cold call. So who cares? And on that note, I can't think of a better way to end a fantastic discussion. Lou, Dan, Josh, thank you so much for all of the wisdom you brought to the discussion today, all the energy, um, and have a fantastic 2021. So thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody. Yeah. Bye.